Okay, so uh, next up we have Pete Reeser uh, from Paleotech Albuquerque with his talk entitled Creating a High Resolution Mold and Cast of Van Clevia Campi. I put this slide up so there'd be something for you to look at while I set up this talk. Um, I, first of all, I have to apologize for the quality of some of the shots you'll see after this. I did all of this work just before I had cataract surgery. And while I could see very well, five inches in front of my eyes, I couldn't focus the camera and, and had to rely on autofocus. And also, I'm working alone in my own shop, and so I would frequently forget to take pictures at various stages. And as we all know, it's much better to have somebody else taking the pictures when you're uh, doing something. So this is going to be an attempt to show a continuous process in a kaleidoscope of images. And uh, I hope I get through all of them so you have time to ask all those WTF questions at the end. <laughs> but. Reserve your aesthetic judgment for the very last slide because, because you will see the product in its eventual exhibit environment. And what I, I should also mention, you'll see two rare and exotic Triassic specimens uh, in this presentation. And the, uh, the, first, uh, the object of all of this activity is to produce to isolate a single individual in a bone bed, in a fairly flat bone bed, and produce a cast of it that could be exhibited while eliminating all of the other distractions that are in the bone bed so you can concentrate on it on a single taxon. This is the femur of Van Clevia campi. It's only about three inches long. So you get an idea of the scale. Also up here are some of the smaller casts that went into this menage. Uh, and uh, there's a particular point I want to make about the process, and so I've, I've included part of the uh, ex uh, air escape channels used in the, in the mold, and, and we'll see that presently. And so I'm just going to run through these. Uh, probably won't explain each image to the depth it should be, just because I want to get through to the end, and I, ho I hope there's enough time for questions afterwards. So here is the cast. Uh, the resulting cast on top of a sub-block of the much, lar uh, much larger Ghost Ranch blocks that came out of the Coelophysis quarry at Ghost Ranch, New Mexico. So you have an idea of what the sub-block looked like before we started. This is the, uh, this is the block, the specimen, uh, the target specimen has a perimeter of clay walls, as you can see, around the edges of it. The rest of the block is covered with aluminum foil as a splash guard. Uh, the registration part of the mold is already, uh, has already been done in a series of pores. You can see the uh, RTV rubber. This is Silicon's Incorporated G1000 that many of us are familiar with. You can see that there's a fairly thick coat on the walls. That's on purpose. We'll see why. This is the mother mold that goes under that registration coat. And you will notice that there are several registration uh, depressions in there to, to very accurately locate that registration part of the mold when it's on the mother mold. Uh, I had to Photoshop some of these images just to bring out the particular feature I was after. I was somewhat appalled at the quality, but you can see the uh, impression coat on the mother mold, dra uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, in the rubber draped over the mother mold. Uh, there had to be some way after that to contain the resin that would be poured into it. So uh, what I did was I cut, uh, I cut a bunch of strips about a quarter of an inch thick of RTV rubber, which were then glued to that skirt that you saw draped over the mother mold using 
uh, regular silicon caulk. This is the, uh, somebody else described silicon caulk. Uh, it, it does indeed cure in 24 hours, and you always want to get the kind uh, that's cured with acetic acid that you can smell, and it, it, it adheres very well to RTV rubber. This is the underside. Uh, there was one point. There was one point in this specimen where there was a depression that went from the observable side of the carapace all the way to the underside of the other carapace. And it would have been a mistake to have filled that with solid rubber because that's when you get damage in specimens when you try to remove the rubber. So I, I, it, when I was molding, I put a, a clay plug in there. And uh, after, after the mold was pulled, I removed the clay and made a plaster plug so that the, the thickness of the rubber when it's removed is just about the same over the entire surface. So when it's removed, there's no damage. Now, what this shot shows is filling the seam. This is the ball. This is the registration mold. And there's a, there's a crack here. There's a seam that is filled with the with the small batches of rubber but it after taking after spending all that time getting a superb impression the last thing you want to do is spill tiny drops of rubber on it so what I'm showing here is a glue injector held in place with a stand and what I would do is I'd fill a glue injector set it all up and not touch the plunger until I didn't have to worry about making any drips on the registration surface. Uh, once the whole thing is done and together, the next step is to level the mold as, as much as possible in two axes. And that was done by shimming the bottom of the mother mold. Then you want to determine the volume. You know, usually we do this with water. Uh, this particular mold takes two gallons total, uh, two gallons total of urethane resin. I use urethanes because I'm massively allergic to epoxy. Uh, but in a mold like this, that's made with multiple seams, you don't want to use water because it's almost impossible to remove all of the water and urethane behaves very badly in the presence of water. So what I used was epoxy coated aquarium gravel to arrive at to arrive at the volume, and that's also useful for bean bags later. And uh, it's epoxy coated because it leaves no residue, it's so you can you can dump it out. And you have a perfectly clean mold. This is the mold filled, but you notice there are two islands from the registration service that didn't get covered well enough. And this is the seat of the pants fix. I just made horseshoe dams over those two. And I would pour a very thin coat of resin on that just to seal it. Once that, once the seal set, I would fill up the dam and it took care of the problem. This is the, this shows the underside of the cast. You can see those two islands where we use the horseshoe dams and the, the what, what you see in the middle there is the receiver for the armature held on with uh, a product you probably have here in Canada too called JB Weld, which is a steel field epoxy. The bond with urethane is extraordinary. It, it, uh, the urethane will break before the bond does. So for, uh, for something like attaching armature, it's perfect. Uh, one point I wanted to make is that I, I vacuum my rubber, I vacuum my resin multiple times during the process. I have equipment that allows me to do that very rapidly. But using, I wanted to make the point that using containers like this with widely flaring sides is, are very efficient under vacuum because you almost never have a spillover. It, it contains the meniscus very well. and, and it almost eliminates any sorts of spillovers. Uh, you've seen this. Uh, the this is uh, uh, this is the the cast. Uh, the 
point I wanted to make here, and it's, it, it'll, it's very easily seen in the example, is that the contact between air escape channels and the sprue, the, the bore of the air escape channels is very wide. The sprues are very large, but the actual contact is very small. And the reason for that is you can get, you need to have enough flow of, of the resin to where it carries, carries away all the bubbles. You can get all of this done uh, with limited pot life. The pot life in the urethane I'm using is about 20 minutes. And, it, it, and that's not very critical. You can easily get everything done in 20 minutes, but sometimes we're using materials with pot lifes of four or five minutes, and, and, and this becomes critical. And I'll, I, I'll uh, expand on this subject shortly. Uh, this is the cast of the femur and the actual femur. These, uh, uh, this and the next slide are here, uh, mainly because of some objections Marilyn Fox brought up to my methods, which, uh, which is I always vacuum the rubber directly on the specimen. Uh, and Marilyn objected, thinking that vacuuming the rubber on a specimen increases the probability of damage by infiltration of the rubber into the specimen. My position is that if the specimen is uh, well prepared enough to be cast, that vacuuming directly on the specimen doesn't increase the risk, but it does greatly lessen the possibilities of bubbles in the registration coat. So this is the skull of this, uh, of this specimen after the process was completely finished, and there was zero, absolutely no damage. This is the other side. And I'm, I'm waiting to hear from Marilyn at the end of this talk. Uh, <laughs> this is, this, uh, uh, and w one reason that this works so well, this is a fairly blurry picture, but in filling, in filling those cracks and, and crevices, uh, we used uh, a Van Aken modeling clay. But in the bottom of the crevices, you don't want the clay. This is packed tissue paper. Uh, which will then be covered with uh, a veneer of, uh, of that same modeling clay. But on, on all those, uh, those areas where we used clay, uh, the surface is stippled with uh, a mimeograph stylus. Some of you are old enough to remember what a mimeograph stylus is. But it, uh, what it does is it produces a surface like a miniature golf ball. Uh, with a series of dimples. It's unobtrusive, but it's immediately recognizable as uh, not specimen, not bone. Now, another consideration is that, especially in the delicate specimens, uh, in order to take full advantage of the elasticity of the RTV rubber, it has to be very thin. So, on, particularly on the skull, uh, this is going to be a layup mold. The part of the rubber that actually covers the skull will be an eighth of an inch thick, no thicker. And this is the first coat. Uh, when I pour the rubber, I first evacuate the particular batch of rubber. Uh, I, I pour it all over the specimen in a lattice as if you were pouring frosting on a strudel, put it under the vacuum. The meniscus of the vacuum completely covers the surface. You don't have to worry about not getting coverage on some tiny part of it. The vacuum, the, the meniscus recedes, and, and you proceed to do the layup. One other point on all of this, especially on uh, delicate specimens like this, is I let the rubber set up under pressure, the same pressure I'll use later when I am, when I am filling that mold with resin. That, that way, if there are some voids, if some voids in the rubber that you didn't see and, and didn't take care of, uh, they will not, uh, they will maintain the same volume that the, that the mold, uh, uh, I'm losing my train of thought here. What, what happens is, the, oh my God, already? 
I'm going to go this, go through this very quickly. Okay, uh, it's layup of uh, using uh, nylon stocking material to reinforce it. Uh, you always have to find the, the bubbles of nylon stocking material and cut them out every time. Here's the close-up, cutting out the bubbles. Here's the, here's the skull. Here's the skull mold. It, it, uh, uh, rubber. rubber works better than anything else for uh, putting together these sandwiches of, mold, of uh, mother molds and rubber. Uh, one of the points I wanted to make is the contact area up here. Can you see that at the, at the end of the skull? It's extremely tiny, but the bore of the escape channels makes the whole thing work much more efficiently. You'll be able to see that down here. Uh, the sprues need to be cut off. This is a this is a motorized coping saw called a motor saw. It's older than I am. <laughs> then the stubs from the sprues need to be cut closer to contour. This is this is a, a, a tiny little pencil grinder with a carbide burr. That's what, uh, that's what that's used for. Then they are carved completely to contour. These are sewing needles. Uh, home to a bevel on, on the top that is uh, a carbide needle. It's about the sixteenth of an inch. The molds, uh, the cast, every resin cast has, has some sort of oil scrum on it. Uh, I, I do not use any sort of solvent to take this off. I, I use some sort of detergent. Uh, Organex, the, the, Organex and Alkinex, I think we're all familiar with for cleaning laboratory glassware. It works extremely well for cleaning, uh, cleaning the cast. This is the skull. It looks a little cartoonish here. This is, the, uh, this is the skull in the last stages of painting. It has one more wash to go. This is the complete, I, I, lots of shots of the completed one so you can see it in different environments. Here it is in the shop. Here it is in the harsh morning light. Uh, here it is in its exhibits environment. This is the second rare Triassic specimen. This is Alex Downs at Ghost Ranch. Uh, and the, uh, the Ghost Ranch block is behind him there. And this is a close-up of the cast in its exhibit environment. Do we have time for questions? Lay it on me. <laughs> yeah.